Thanks to the organizers for, for the invitation to, to, to give this talk. They, I, they, um, I was first in contact with them, I think it was sometime last year, and I kind of let it slide for a very long time. So I'm glad that, uh, when I finally got back to them, they were still agreeable to me giving this talk. Um, so three notes before I leave this slide. So this is a drama in five acts, which means there will be brief intermissions between the acts. Those will be uh, some opportunities to ask questions. Uh, second is that the slides uh, are available both, um, well, the, the link has been posted in chat um, for my slides. Uh, there, that's just a, a link to my webpage. There's also a, a handout version if you prefer not to see the, the overlays. And third, I, normally I would start by acknowledging that my campus sits on unceded ancestral land of the Kumeyaay Nation. But as Mike pointed out today, I'm in Washington, DC which turns out uh, if you check nativeland.ca, which you should, it's the ancestral land of the Piscataway and Nakachatank people who uh, Europeans call Anacostian because that's easier to pronounce. Great, okay. So, uh, so act one is where we meet the characters. So the, the characters in this uh, drama are abelian varieties and their associated vape polynomials. So A is always going to be an abelian variety over a finite field FQ. Um, and I'm, I'm going to refer frequently to the order of an abelian variety, which is a slightly non-standard terminology. When I say the order of A, I always mean the order of the group of rational points of A. So I'm not forgetting that A is an, an object of algebraic geometry. I'm just you know, keeping track of how many points it has over its field of definition. And of course, that's a group. Uh, but we're not going to be using the group structure very much in this talk. Mostly, we're going to be using uh, Vey's interpretation of this order as the value of a polynomial. So uh, there's a polynomial, P of t, which has integer coefficients such that this order of P of 1, and this polynomial comes from, well, it's, okay, it's the characteristic polynomial for Banius acting on the l adic tape module of A, for any prime L not dividing Q, any prime L not equal to the characteristic. But what you really need to know for this talk is that it's a polynomial, which is monic of degree two times the dimension of the abelian variety. And uh, as a polynomial viewed over the complex numbers, all of its roots have absolute value Q to the one half. And such things are called Q V polynomials. And this talk is mostly not about abelian varieties per se, it's mostly about vape polynomials. So uh, the abelian varieties are, are, are part of the motivation, but they recede into the background of the action fairly quickly. Uh, they, may, they will appear briefly again at the end. Um, so I'll just mention that a lot of what I'm doing depends on the fact that uh, there is built-in code in SAGE to enumerate vape polynomials. Uh, this is based on an algorithm that I started working out um, more than 10 years ago by now, but uh, relatively recently, this code got incorporated into SAGE, so you can run experiments like this, where you ask SAGE for all the vape polynomials for a given Q and a given D. D is, twice, is the degree of the polynomial, so it's two times G, and as long as you don't make these parameters too large, you get the answer back fairly efficiently. Um, so the main thing that uh, makes the abelian varieties not so critical for this talk is the fact that there's this very tight correspondence due to Honda Tate between isogeny classes of simple abelian varieties over FQ and irreducible Q V polynomials. So if A is a simple abelian variety over FQ, its associated poly polynomial will be a power of some irreducible where the integer can be read off from the polynomial, but most of the time in practice, it's equal to one. So in particular, if Q is prime, which will be most of the time in this talk, um, it's more or less always the case that the characteristic polynomial of A will actually be irreducible. So sort of the abelian variety being simple, which is kind of like irreducible, it doesn't factor as a product uh, up to isogeny, that corresponds to the polynomial being irreducible in the usual sense. Um, as a reminder, when I say isogeny, I mean it's a morphism which is surjective with finite kernel. 
Um, so we're not going to be talking so much about isomorphism classes of abelian varieties. That's a little bit more subtle. We're going to be talking about isogeny classes because these correspond exactly to um, vape polynomials. And the order of an abelian variety will be invariant under isogeny because it only depends on the vape polynomial. So it, it's natural when we're talking about orders to just work up to isogeny. And yeah, so uh, as, I as, the, as I made this point earlier on a previous slide, the upshot of Honda Tate is that problems about existence of abelian varieties of a given order or over a given FQ are really problems about existence of vape polynomials with certain properties. What that means is that for most of the action, we will not be seeing abelian varieties explicitly we will be just manipulating polynomials and deducing consequences about abelian varieties from that. So most of the work in this talk is happening at the level of constructing uh, or you know, ruling out the existence of VE polynomials under certain conditions. So really this is a number theory talk and not an arithmetic geometry talk, except at the end, maybe some, some uh, curves into Jacobians will, will sneak back in. Uh, uh, I mentioned on the, uh, on the previous slide that the order of an abelian variety is an isogeny variant, but the isomorphism class is not. So for example, you can have one abelian variety whose group of rational points is, you know, Z is cyclic of order two times cyclic of order two being isogenous to another one whose group is cyclic of order four. Uh, the, the calculations that I'm going to be doing, since they're only at the level of the vape polynomial, they will only see the order and not the isomorphism class. Questions about existence of abelian varieties with a given group structure are also tractable, but they use a different set of ideas in combination with these. So there's a, a recent preprint of Marcellia and Springer um, that explains the relationship between um, these kind of results up to isogeny, um, which prescribe a given group order and results at the level of isomorphism that prescribe a given isomorphism class of, of the group of rational points. That's the, end. Uh, sorry, that's almost the end of act one. Uh, no, it is the end of act one. So let me pause for a moment to see if there are any questions. I don't see any in chat. All right, seeing none uh, and hearing none, uh, let me continue. So in, in act two, uh, we look at orders over F2. Uh, so now for, for the moment, let me not specify F2, but on this slide, let A be an abelian variety of some dimension G over some finite field FQ. Uh, remember what I said about the order being P of one, where P is a V polynomial. Well, if you just use the information uh, that's implicit in that statement about the roots on uh, the complex roots all being on the circle uh, absolute value of t is equal to square root of q, that implies a lower bound and an upper bound on this order. So the upper, the upper bound is square root of q plus one power two g, and the lower bound is square root of q minus one power two g. So the leading order term is q to the g, the correction is q to the g minus a half. Um, um, so if q is large compared, uh, if, if g is large, uh, sorry, when q is large compared to g, there are, there are gaps between these intervals for consecutive values of g. So, you know, uh, this a, this number will be close to QG. And if you go to G plus one, that number will be close to Q to the G plus one. If Q is large, then there will be a gap between the intervals that you get. Um, uh, but when Q equals two, um, there, there isn't going to be any gap because this number is actually less than one. So, the, the lower bound for Q equals two is meaningless. It, it tells you nothing because of course the order is at least one because it's a group. It has an identity element. Um, it can't be zero. So when Q equals two, you don't have any intervals that any integers that are obviously excluded from occurring. And so you might ask, well, is it the case that every integer occurs? And 
Um, this is the content of a theorem of mine with Everett Howe. We proved that yes, every positive integer is the order of at least one abelian variety over F2. More precisely, we show that in this range, um, every positive integer going from say this about four thirds two to the D minus one to about four thirds two to the D occurs um, for a polynomial of degree two uh, D. For some reason, uh, this was the D here is is what I was calling G before, but never mind. Um, so these intervals, you'll notice, they line up perfectly. Um, uh, so you don't you don't miss anything. Um, you pick up every integer because you sort of tiled the, the, the positive integers with these intervals. Uh, we can also ensure that the polynomial is ordinary, um, which in this case means that the middle coefficient is odd. Uh, geometrically, this means that the resulting abelian variety has two torsion subgroup over F2 bar as large as possible, where rank is D. Um, I see uh, Sarnak has asked, do you use the distribution of roots? Um, I mean, this is, a, this is a, a statement about just finding one abelian variety. So we more or less give an explicit formula for a Vey polynomial. Um, so this is not a question that involves analyzing the distribution. This is a question about really producing a concrete uh, polynomial for every choice of the order. And I'll show you in a moment how we, how we do that. My question was, can you hear me? No? Yes. Yeah, thanks. My question was whether in that example, okay, I'll, we'll see how the roots are distributed. Okay. Yeah, maybe, maybe yeah, we, when I get to the end of this act, that might be a good time to, to ask this again. So, yeah, so let me go through briefly how this is, this is proved. The proof is actually only a couple of pages, so I can give you most of it. Um, the key lemma is uh, an older result of De Pippo and Howe. So this is a sufficient condition for a, a polynomial hat to be a a polynomial, at least if it has integer coefficients. But this is really a statement about polynomials with real number coefficients. Um, so I take a sequence of real numbers, um, which are not too large, they satisfy some kind of weight condition. Um, so A1 through AN are bounded in some way. And if they're, if they're small like this, then the complex roots of this polynomial that I get by using A1 through AN as the first coefficients and then making it reciprocal uh, to, to finish, uh, the complex roots of this polynomial are pairwise distinct and lie in the circle absolute value of z equals square root of q. Um, so th this is essentially uh, sort of a winding number argument. Uh, we'll see another one like it later. Um, a very short way to say this, which Bjorn Poonen suggested to us, is that um, if you look at the function f of z over z to the n on this circle, it's real valued and it has sign changes at the roots of unity, right? If you start with, um, um, if you start with, uh, uh, if you start with the AIs all being zero, then you 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 have a polynomial that manifestly has uh, roots on the circle, uh, and the sign changes sort of survive when you when you perturb this much. Uh, There's a question in chat, which I'm going to answer on a later slide. So I'll hold on to it for a moment. Um, yeah, so now you have to show uh, that every positive integer actually occurs as f of one for some polynomial like this. Now, when we originally were working on this, right, to Pippo and Howe uh, wrote this lemma down in the late 1990s. And, at the, and they, in their paper, they point out that it gives you some intervals. But um, for a long time, I think everybody, including me and, and including Everett, thought that these intervals weren't going to be wide enough to actually cover all integers. Uh, and so we thought we were going to have to upgrade this criterion in order to actually prove this. And then we somehow discovered, uh, initially by doing numerical experiments and then observing what was going on, that actually 
this is enough. Uh, and the proof of this is, is a tweak of a very classic fact from the early history of computer science that every positive integer in, admits a unique non-adjacent binary representation. So you can write it as a sum of powers of two with signs where you don't use any two consecutive powers of two. So this might be familiar for, to those of you who are used to implementing elliptic curve arithmetic for crypto purposes, for example. Um, so this is a, a tweak of that um, because it's not quite the problem we're, we're solving, right? We, we essentially have to represent something, we have to put two to the i plus one here instead of two to the i, and then it's not exactly the same proof, but it's very similar. And then once you've done that, then you get a vague polynomial that does what you want. So there's the, there's the concrete construction. And this, I think, will answer a question that was raised in the chat. What about larger Q? So yeah, Q equals three. Uh, you don't get much mileage out of the V bounds either. Um, but it is at least the case that, uh, so for every prime power Q, every sufficiently large positive integer is the order of at least one abelian variety over FQ. This is a result of Van Bommel, Costa, Lee, Poonen, and Smith. Uh, for Q equals three, I believe they do get every order. Um, for Q equals five, I forget which, where, I think for Q equals seven, you don't get the order two. Um, but up to that, you get all orders. Um, and you can, you can ask for more conditions like ordinary, simple, or principally polarizable, but that will change what sufficiently large means. So for example, for Q equals four, uh, you get all orders, but if you, if you insist on ordinary, then you miss one of the small numbers. I forget which one. Um, yeah, and again, the point is that the Ve bounds do start to overlap once G is large enough. Um, it's not the case that every interval uh, integer in this interval occurs, but you can make this interval a little bit shorter um, and get an interval in which you can find everything by a kind of more sophisticated version of what we did with Everett. Um, this is also refinement of results of Aubry, Aloui, Lachaud, and, and Kadyets. Um, the result of Kadyets is in some sense a motivation for a lot of what I'm talking about. So I wanna give a shout out to that. I think that's the end of act two. So this is a good point. Uh, maybe uh, Peter can, can circle back to his question and I can see if there are any other questions. Um, so where are the roots of this polynomial? Are they uh, running around? As you know, you can make the roots uh, avoid intervals. I mean, Sarah's studied that. So are these, where are the, um, in this polynomial that you constructed, do you know where the roots are? Uh, we didn't make any efforts to um, sort of constrain the roots. Uh, I mean, in some sense, they're relatively close to the roots of the of the of the you know, they're relatively close to Q to the one half times roots of unity because we're deforming that polynomial. So that will give, that will give you some, some yeah. condition, but we didn't check very carefully. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, we're not uh, sort of probing it, arbitrarily far into the space of a problem. Did you try to do this with curves? Um, well, I'll talk about curves at the end a little bit. Okay, all right. That's act five. When you have your polynomial constructed in your way, I mean, the polynomial satisfying all your conditions. Are you able to give us uh, an example of abelian variety that for that polynomial? I mean, uh, we did not attempt case? to go, we did not attempt to explicitly write down the abelian varieties that come up. Um, right. A hint how it is looking like, because well, otherwise it's just a, what you are doing, you opera in five acts, right? It's yes. Just, just, so, just, I yeah, mean, so this, uh, I mean, uh, with zeros on the unit circle. Yeah, so of course, you, you, in principle, you could invert, you could run through the proof of Honda Tate, uh, right? One of those is to lift a character, you know, sort of do everything in characteristic zero by explicit, you know, analytic complex multiplication, find a model over some number field, reduce, and then descend because that will give you typically something, a base extension of the thing you actually want. Um, there's also a more algebraic approach by maybe Chai and Ort, um, but neither of those is, is extremely explicit. So it would be 
Um, yeah, exactly. I, I have not tried to make explicit examples, except in a few cases that I'll talk about in Act Five. I mean, something uh, constructed out of elliptic curves, some kind of products, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. I don't know how much that would cover of, uh, of the sort of yeah. the whole whole range. I mean, of course, the problem with taking a product of elliptic curves is that the order will be a product as well, so you won't get all possibilities yeah, right. uh, that way. Thank you. All right, I don't see more questions. So if I don't hear any more, maybe we can move to act three. So in act three, each order happens many, many times. Um, so the, the motivation for this act is uh, this statement, which is also a refinement of a theorem of Aubry Alouis Lachaud. This is the version by, uh, uh, well, this maybe you can deduce this already from Aubry Alouis Lachaud, but I, I would, the, there's a stronger version of this theorem uh, in the paper by Kadietz. For every prime power Q greater than two, you actually get an exponential lower bound if you insist on simple abelian varieties. So this is another answer to the question about Q equals three that came up in chat. So even for Q equals three, for simple abelian varieties and Q equals four, I should mention, um, for simple abelian varieties, you do get an exponential lower bound with one exception, namely there are elliptic curves of order one over uh, Q3 and Q4. Just, they fall in the Haas interval and uh, right, it's due to, right, it's an old theorem of Doering that everything in the Haas interval, at least for, uh, for prime order shows up, but also for Q equals four in this case. Um, so, Okay, so for Q is at least seven, this is immediate from the Weil bound. For smaller Q, uh, this is a kind of classic strategy in algebraic number theory. Uh, this goes back to Castle's, this, this kind of approach to identifying algebraic integers of small trace and norm. Um, this kind of question was also studied in detail by Raphael Robinson. And so indeed, when you run into the case Q equals two, you hit a sort of threshold for this problem. This, this kind of threshold is what Robinson studied very carefully. And you actually hit the threshold for Q equals two and something very different happens, which I'll mention on the next slide. So this is all kind of related to things like the, the Schur, Siegel, Smith trace problem. I wanted to give a shout out to Alex Smith. He, he's been working on this. Uh, he has a, a not yet public, I think, preprint, um, uh, making some progress on that question. Uh, but that will not directly intervene uh, in this story because somehow QE. I think that's on the archive now, uh, Kiran. Oh, it's great. It's on the archive. Congratulations, Alex. That's a, it's a really nice result. Yes. Uh, but I'm not talking about that because I'm focusing on Q equals two here. And in Q equals two, as I mentioned, uh, the situation is kind of different. So there's a good reason why you can't improve the Weil bound, even for simple abelian varieties for Q equals two. And it's because this old theorem um, of modern, this combines a theorem of modern Paul with a theorem of Robinson. If you take a simple abelian variety over FQ of order one, then first of all, this can only exist when Q is at most four. Zero, the zero abelian variety is not simple. So that doesn't, that's not a counterexample. Um, Right, just like one isn't prime. Uh, if Q is three or four, then the only thing you get is the uh, elliptic curve that I alluded to earlier. But for Q equals two, you get infinitely many simple abelian varieties of order one. And you can describe their Frobenius eigenvalues rather explicitly. They are things you get by taking a root of unity and then solving this quadratic equation. Most of the time, this gives you a quadratic extension there are a couple of exceptional cases, n equals seven and n equals 30, where a root of unity of order n gives you a split quadratic equation. And so that in those cases, you get two different isogeny classes, but most of the time you get a unique isogeny class corresponding to each root of unity. Um, and uh, this more or less the, the proof is that if you look at alpha minus one over alpha bar minus one, um, Right, the, the order of the abelian variety is essentially the norm of alpha minus one. And so since that's one, uh, alpha minus one is a unit in the ring of algebraic integers, as is alpha bar minus one. 
So the ratio is, a, is an algebraic integer whose conjugates all have absolute value one. So Kronecker's theorem tells you it's a root of unity. And that's, that, so that implies this equation. And then the, the, the contribution of Robinson is to use the, the strategy of castles to show that you only get a, a, a non, a, you only get a splitting when n equals seven or 30. So you, you compute the discriminants of the equation and ask whether it's a square. This is a problem about writing uh, something as a, uh, some number as a, as a sum of very few roots of unity. So it's kind of classic algebraic number theory to, to solve that problem. Yeah, so there are these infinite family of abelian varieties um, of order one. And so th the, the main result of this act is this theorem that says that every, every positive integer, not just one, but every positive integer occurs as the order of infinitely many simple abelian varieties over F2. Um, now, for M equals one, we have an explicit recipe for doing this. For M greater than one, it's, we don't give, a, we give a somewhat explicit recipe in that I can, we construct infinite sequences of they polynomials realizing a particular order. So the sequence of they polynomials, you know, giving you a given order is explicit. It's a kind of tweak of the polynomials that come out of the modern Paul construction. The catch is they don't a priori come to you as irreducible polynomials and we're looking for simple abelian varieties in this case. So you have to massage things in order to actually be able to prove that they're simple. And essentially what you do is you rig everything up so that you can prove irreducibility over Q2, either directly using the Eisenstein criterion, or, uh, which is due to Schoenemann originally, um, or you know, there's a sort of generalized Eisenstein criterion where you say, I cook things up so that the Newton polygon uh, the two adic Newton polygon has only a single um, slope with no interior vertices. So maybe it has rise three and run uh, co prime to three. So that's not the vanilla uh, Schoenemann Eisenstein criterion, but it, is, it does still imply irreducibility over Q2 and hence over Q. Um, now, we don't quite do this for the original polynomial. We show, we show that there is a factorization with a cofactor of bounded degree. Um, and then the rest I claim is what I want most of the time because these polynomials will satisfy some second order linear occurrences sort of, of Chebyshev type. And um, you can show that any factor that occurs more than once actually gives you order one. So pulling those out doesn't, doesn't affect the order. So that's the, that's the strategy. Now, let me show you how to write down these polynomials. So um, the so I'm going to start with this, you know, the number theorist normalization of the Chebyshev polynomial, which is the one that makes it monic. Um, so Tn evaluated two cosine theta, theta equals two cosine n theta, right? It's also the number theorist normalization because these are supposed to be algebraic integers when you plug in a, a rational multiple of pi. So I'm going to sort of tweak this polynomial um, in, a, in a particular way. Uh, this, this factor x plus x inverse minus 4, I don't think I included a graph in here. Uh, so I'll just say this, this Laurent polynomial has the property, um, well, maybe I'll come back to why this Laurent polynomial is a special one in a moment. Um, so this basically gives you the construct, the, the, the polynomials that come from the modern Paul construction. That's in some sense why I'm doing this, but I can say more. Uh, and then I, I kind of rig up some, some weird linear combination of these things and then divide out a big factor of X minus one. Uh, so this is some recipe that you can follow. And um, this is partially rigged up by, I did some experiments and it worked, but there's a better reason why it worked, um, which is on the next slide, which is that there's there's something kind of like the the uh, de Pippo Howe lemma that applies here, that says the following: If I take a sequence of real numbers um, ending in one, such that if I use these as roots of a poly, uh, as the coefficients of a polynomial, uh, I get a polynomial whose complex roots 
have absolute values at most square root of two. So again, this is a condition that says that these, these numbers are not too large. Um, uh, if, I, if I use this, then um, if I make uh, a coefficient, if I use these as, as the coefficients of a linear combination of the polynomials G, N, K from this slide, which again are kind of modif tweaked from Chebyshev polynomials in some way, uh, because I have a moving index n here, I get an infinite sequence of polynomials. And all of these polynomials um, give you roots which are real pairwise distinct. And in this interval, three minus two root two, three plus two root two. And again, this is some kind of winding number calculation that proves this. And the point is the following. So uh, on one hand, this is an interval uh, whose endpoints multiplied one, right? Because nine minus eight. Uh, on the other hand, if I translate, then I get minus two root two plus two root two, which is where you end up if you take a complex number of absolute value root two and add it to its complex conjugate. So, uh, if I, so this polynomial shifted will then give me uh, the, what I call the trace polynomial associated to a, a two-V polynomial with the right order. Uh, we, well, with, whose order is whatever, uh, whatever this thing is. The trick is that G and I, did I say this? Oh, I don't think I said this. Um, G and I has, has a value two to the I. So, uh, so whatever, whatever binary representation, uh, whatever this binary representation of sorts spits out, that number is represented um, as the order of infinitely many vape polynomials. Uh, yeah, so now, right, so the, the polynomial, the, the mysterious Laurent polynomial x plus x inverse minus four is the one that carries this interval uh, to uh, plus two root two down to minus two root two at the, at the value one, and then back up to plus two root two. So it's rigged up to have, uh, to sort of shift the, the usual graph of a, a Chebyshev polynomial, um, over to this interval that's relevant for constructing Bay numbers. Uh, okay, so that's the end of this act. So if there are questions about this, uh, I can take those here. Okay, I don't see anything. So let's talk about act four. So act four is another look at abelian varieties of order one. So uh, in this act, I wanna distinguish between simple and geometrically simple. An abelian variety is geometrically simple if it stays simple when you base extend it to any finite extension of the base field or equivalently to an algebraic closure. Now, again, this is really a condition on they polynomials, at least if the characteristic polynomial of A is irreducible, which it more or less always is um, in my situation. So this condition says that no two of the, the Frobenius eigenvalues, so no two roots of the they polynomial have a ratio, which is a non-trivial root of unity. So uh, this is a, a condition for any given polynomial. This is a, a relatively easy thing to check computationally. Um, if you want to check this for infinite families, this is also tractable, as, as we'll see. Um, for any given m greater than one, I expect there are infinitely many geometrically simple abelian varieties of order m, but I have no idea how to prove this. Um, uh, so I'm not going to focus on that question because that seem, my my approach on the previous uh, in the previous act doesn't seem to give this. Uh, at least I don't know how to how to control that. Uh, so instead, let me look at m equals one, where we don't have any choice over the Vey polynomials. We just have a, a list. Uh, we we know what all of them are, and we just look at that construction and we see what happens. So. 
here's what we do. So uh, the main result in this act is a theorem um, with Torin Danelli Wardy, who was a, a summer research intern with me. Uh, so they are a Berkeley undergrad who's applying to grad schools right now. So you should admit them, right? So this theorem says the following, if I pick a positive integer n, that gives me um, one or possibly two in a few cases, isogeny classes of simple abelian varieties of order one over F2. And I ask, well, what happens when I decompose that over F2 bar? Well, it, it's always gonna be isogenous to some power of a simple abelian variety over F2 bar. And so the real content in this question is what is the power? And it turns out that you do get geometrically simple examples um, infinitely often when n is a power of two, you do get something geometrically simple. Um, most of the rest of the time you get uh, f equals two. Um, the, the exceptional cases give you exceptional answers. Um, but yeah, so most of the time you get two factors and there's a good reason for this. Um, and this, but this reason doesn't apply to powers of two. And in that case, you usually only get one factor. Um, so here's an interesting corollary of this, um, which I don't know how to prove directly. It's just a corollary of this classification. Uh, you can also compute the, the Newton polygons of these things without too much trouble. And you show that A is ordinary if and only if N is not a power of two. And so what that means is that there is no simple abelian variety over, uh, over F2, which has order one, which is ordinary and which is geometrically simple. So those conditions together uh, run into each other. Um, and it's, it's a little surprising you can prove this given that there are infinitely many simple abelian varieties of order one, uh, but it's a consequence of the fact that we have an explicit classification. So we can do this. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, this uh, is, a, is, a, is a type of problem that may be familiar to some people in this audience. Uh, I have, you know, say I take two Fermanius eigenvalues. Uh, for this, I don't have to assume they occur in the same um, simple abelian variety. So this actually gives you some information that I'll use later when you do this with different abelian varieties. It gives you information about, um, you know, homomorphisms over um, extensions of F2. So I take two Fermanius eigenvalues, both of which have this form, which is say they both are roots of quadratic equations involving roots of unity A to one and A to two. And I also want to assume that their ratio is a root of unity. So that, uh, that's a third um, A to three that I put in here. So now I have uh, three equations and five variables. What do I do? I eliminate alpha one and alpha two, that gives me one polynomial in three variables. Uh, and I'd like to find solutions of that uh, um, equation in roots of unity. And there's a sort of stand, there are standard techniques for doing this. Um, we use the, the method of Conway Jones, which involves writing down all the additive relations among short sums of roots of unity. Uh, you can classify those. I think at, at, at the moment, the record is that those are classified up to uh, 24 summands. Um, there's a preprint by uh, Christie and Klepp, I think, that goes out to 24. Um, we actually use some non-trivial subset of that result. Um, uh, we also use some sage math code that I wrote um, for this earlier paper, um, you know, paper from last year with Kopakov, Quinn, and Rubenstein, where we classify tetrahedral with rational dihedral angles. That was actually a much more serious instance of this problem. That was a polynomial in six variables because it involves uh, six variables corresponding to six dihedral angles of a tetrahedron. Um, so I had to write a whole bunch of code to solve intermediate problems involving three variables. So that that code off the shelf handles this problem relatively easily. So that did that did a lot of the heavy lifting for us. 
Um, then we have to kind of interpret what the answers are. You do get some, uh, some parametric solutions. So one of the parametric solutions is the reason why you get a two here and not a one. So there's a sort of systematic collision that happens between two of these roots of unity. Um, it's sort of an, a fun exercise to, to find it, or you can just look in our, look in our preprint. Um, and then there are sporadic cases that you, you, you use to explain uh, the other entries at the table. So that's, uh, uh, so that's uh, the end of act four. So let me pause once more to see if there are questions about, about this. I have a question to, the, to Act Three, actually. Oh, yeah, we can go back to. Yeah. Let me uh, go back to. You said that uh, all numbers are represented well under the conditions. Uh, yeah. So uh, right. So I'm sorry. I, I, I right. And uh, do you have any idea on can, how, how, not necessarily uniformly, but order of magnitude, are the set, set, certain values special that they appear very rarely? Yeah, or some other. I mean. Just lower upper bound. Uh, I did not so look into the this. This question about equidistribution, but much easier. Uh, and but still, you know, whether there's certain special values in the same uh, statistic, you know. Yeah, we, we. I didn't look. I, I didn't try to make any effort to uh, look at lower estimates. So in in Act Two, the uh, the work of uh, Van Bommel, et cetera, does maybe give you some information like this. Um, for this problem, right, it's, it, it's, I found it very difficult to, to do anything quantitative. Um, because, I mean, right, I'm, I'm, I'm in, if you look at the space of Vey polynomials, I'm, I'm in some very small corner. Um, and, you know, the number of points in this corner is a much lower, you know, is a, is a smaller power than the main term. So I, I, have to, I have to use an optic where I really sort of look from this point of view um, and make it more quantitative. And I haven't entirely figured out how to do that. Um, so it, 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 would, it will take more ideas, I think, to really get quantitative estimates about you know, lower bounds for how many, how many times you can represent a given integer. I mean, other question, I, I'm really not familiar with this subject, but uh, if you, I mean, you don't, you don't discuss that the examples of the subject varieties having, having the, the very point. Again, even, it would, you would have to go through uh, Honda Tate to find yeah, that. Yeah, it's up to the, the isogenic classes. But the question is, is, uh, is um, I mean, if you don't have these examples, how do you, how do you know that, uh, that uh, somewhat, equal, you know, in size, the multiplicities. I mean, your construction in your mind behind the back, you are not giving it, right? it just only shows that, that these numbers do are, do, are represented indeed. Yeah, I, I, but, but statistic would probably require the interference into the construction, no? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a question for future investigation, I think, is to, to try to either by constructing examples on the abelian variety side or more likely doing a better analysis on the Vey polynomial side to get more quantitative information. Okay, that's okay. That's all. Thank you. All right. Um, if, if there are no other questions about parts one through, acts one through four. Uh, uh, let me talk a little bit about act five. So act five is of course um, where I, 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 I close up some loose, en loose ends, but also tease a sequel. Uh, so, uh, uh, so here's where we actually get to, we'll start to see some abelian varieties back in the picture. And so in particular, I want to talk, start talking about Jacobians of curves. We talked a little bit earlier about to what extent you can do things with Jacobians of curves. Um, so 
uh, this theorem uh, of various authors uh, says that, well, there aren't very many curves over finite fields, uh, of, at least of positive genus, if you exclude P1. Uh, so there, there are not very many curves of positive genus over finite fields uh, for which the class number of the function field is equal to one, which is to say the order of the Jacobian variety is equal to one. Um, so there are one, uh, it turns out that not only over F3 and F4, are there one isogeny class each, but there's actually one isomorphism class each. And so all other cases are going to be over F2. So uh, in, the, in the 1970s, Leitzel, Madan, and Queen found five examples in general one, two, and three, uh, and then proved uh, uh, that this list was complete. Uh, and this proof, in air quotes, stood until the mid 2010s um, when Stirpe noticed that they were missing a case. Uh, Stirpe found an example in genus four. Uh, so that's why seven has to be crossed out here. This theorem was published with the, word, with the value seven, but then it had to be corrected uh, to the value eight about 40 years later. So Mercury Stirpe gave a, a corrected proof and Shen and Shi gave an independent corrected proof. Um, so now it really is eight. Uh, um, but this is an interesting cautionary tale. Uh, you should... Uh, trust but verify when you use old results. Uh, but uh, anyway, so here's a, here's a relative version of this problem. So uh, so in, in, the, in the rest of this, in the rest of these slides, I want to talk about the relative version of this. So the relative problem is if you have an extension, a finite extension between two function fields, when can it be the case that the relative class number is equal to one, i.e. The, the, the two function fields have the same class number. So the, when you make an extension of function fields, the class number um, of the bottom function field is always a divisor of the, the uh, class number of the top function field. Um, the ratio is, is the order of the generalized prim variety, if you like. And so, um, you can ask, well, when is that ratio equal to one? Well, one version of this question is when you take a curve and you take a base field extension. So that's in the, in the language of function fields, that's like taking a function field and then you know, taking a constant extension, taking the compositum with a, with a constant extension of FQ. Uh, and so um, you can prove uh, that there are relatively few cases, except um, I should have said G is not equal to zero on this slide. So I'll say that out loud um, because if G equals zero, of course, there's all, you always get one on both sides, but if G is bigger than zero and the order of the Jacobian does not change going from FQ to Q, FQ to the D, then you only have um, a, a specific list of cases for these values of Q, D, and G. Um, and I have an explicit table. Um, there's a whole bunch of values, a whole bunch of cases over F2 and a few cases over F3 and F4. Uh, again, genus one in both of those cases. Uh, but over F2, there is an example of genus three, which I believe was found by Leitzel, Modern, and Queen and back in the 70s. Um, so the way you analyze this is to say, well, I mentioned this, that there's an abelian variety A that measures the ratio between these two things. Um, in this case, it's, it's, you take J of C, you take its base extension, then you take the V restriction of that, and you compare that to J of C. Um, the co-kernel of the map between the two is an abelian variety of order one. So when D is bigger than two, this thing has Frobenius eigenvalues that involve D roots of unity uh, in some way. And so you have to have pairs of eigenvalues whose ratio is the dth root of unity. Um, and so act four comes in, um, especially the part of act four where I allowed you to compare uh, different simple, simple classes. Uh, 
So that that that's secretly why I needed to do that in Act Four. That takes care of all the cases where d is bigger than two. Now, when d equals two, that doesn't help because when d equals two, a is just a quadratic twist of j of c. So within a, there's no anomaly. It's to, j of c has one set of eigenvalues. A has another set of eigenvalues. I, I can't sort of do any internal comparison of eigenvalues to observe anything anomalous. But what I can do is use the fact that a curve, because there's a curve, and a curve over FQ squared has at least as many points. Uh, if, if a curve is over FQ, then it has at least as many points over FQ squared as it does over FQ. And this puts a restriction on A that turns out to be enough to, to, to reduce this to a finite computation. So it's quite critical that we're talking about curves here. This is where we use the fact that it's actually a curve, uh, the Jacobian of a curve, and not just some generic abelian variety. Okay, so this is this is a, a, the relative function field, the class number one problem for extensions of function field that only differ by a constant field extension. The opposite extreme is if you actually have an extension which comes from a, a morphism of curves with the same base field. This is this case is much harder, but um, I can tell you what happens when Q is bigger than two. This should also be in preparation, I should point out. Um, um, so if I had, so geometrically, I have a morphism of curves of degree greater than one. Um, and um, I guess I'm also assuming that uh, I also have to rule out the case where both curves are genus zero and both curves are genus one. Um, so ignore those uh, exceptional cases. Um, so if, if C and C prime have the same class number uh, and Q is not equal to two, then there is a complete list of possibilities. So you can find examples of, um, you know, genus three to genus five over Q equals three. I think this might've also been an example in light so modern queen um, over Q equals four. The best you can do is genus two goes to genus four. Um, uh, so it, I believe over, I didn't write this on the slide, but for genus two to genus four, you might be wondering whether that's a degree two map or a degree three map. I think both possibilities can occur. So you can have a ramified map of degree two or an unramified, uh, uh, or an etal map of degree three. And there's a complete list of possibilities. Um, so the way you, you approach this is, again, there's an abelian variety that whose order measures this ratio. It's the, it's the prim variety for this covering. And again, you use information about numbers of points. So specifically, the upstairs curve has to have a non-negative number of FQ points between uh, the structure of A, which is limited by the theorem that I stated earlier about abelian varieties of order one, in this case, since Q is greater than two, A is just isogenous to a power of a certain elliptic curve. So once you know the order of C, you know the order of C prime and vice versa. So C prime having at least zero points implies that C has quite a few points. And uh, then you compare that to uh, sort of classical by now um, lower bounds on the number of points. These are the ones that come from the, the so-called linear programming method um, of Ihara and especially Ustale, and what which you find in uh, the notes of Serre on uh, rational curves, rational points on curves over finite fields from his Harvard lectures in the 1980s, which are now published uh, by the SMF. So you use a lower bound on number of, of points uh, on a curve for its genus, and that runs, sorry, you use an upper bound on that, you compare it to the lower bound that comes from the constraints of this problem, and that tension creates um, a finite list of possibilities which you then investigate. So, uh, so that sort of solves the geometric version of the relative class number one problem for function fields over F3 or larger, what about F2? Um, 
Well, you can do something similar over F2, but you get a worse answer. You get G less than or equal to seven, G prime less than or equal to 13. This is sharp, by the way. Uh, there actually is an example of a degree of a, of a genus seven curve with a double cover, an unramified double cover, therefore of genus 13, um, where J of C and J of the double cover have the same class number. Uh, I've found exactly one example so far. I'm starting to think it's unique, but I haven't managed to prove that yet. Um, here, it's a, it's a similar argument in that you start with a prim variety that has order one, but now there are lots of possibilities because there are infinitely many simple ones and I have to allow combinations of the simple ones too. So this seems like a mess. Uh, the linear programming method uh, over F2 is not enough uh, because there's an example with, uh, there's, there's an abelian variety of order one with trace zero. Um, but the linear programming method conveniently gives you more than advertised. It actually gives you a lower bound, an upper bound, not just on the number of points on a curve over F2, but it gives you some correction terms that involve the number of points over F4, over F8, and so on with smaller weights. And we actually use uh, those error terms to our advantage to, to, to tighten up the argument um, that I sketched on the previous slide over F2. And that actually ends up being enough to give you a bound. Um, that doesn't quite give you this bound. You then have to, um, I think it gives you G equals nine, and then you have to do some searching over V polynomials to say that uh, you have to spend like two hours searching V polynomials to show that you can't get G equals nine or G equals eight. So uh, this is something you can do. Um, and now you can ask, well, okay, I have a bound. Can I find the complete list? Well, uh, not yet, but I can report one more partial result towards finding the complete list, which is that um, I can prove that all of these, all of these cases where you get the, um, you know, where, where if G is bigger than one, so I'm not messing with genus zero curves or genus one curves, because, you know, I can, those cases I can kind of make lots of, I can, you know, insert isogenies and things. So if I have hyperbolic curves uh, and I have an, uh, not an isomorphism, of course, again, to avoid trivialities, and I have this, and, and both curves in the cover, both the curve and its cover have the same class number, then I actually have to have a cyclic Galois covering. Uh, it doesn't have to be a tall, so Galois here is in the sense of allowing ramification, but it is a sick, the, the extension of function fields has cyclic Galois group. Um, so this involves looking at um, all possible pairs of V polynomials for C and C prime. So you have to do some more searching of the, uh, of the sort that I described on the very first slide. Um, and then of course you can ignore the cases where D equals two because quadratic covers are automatically Galois. So you just worry about covers where D is greater than two. Um, there are about 70 of them. Uh, then you, you kind of go through, this is a kind of argument that's frequently used to uh, refine the upper bounds on the number of points on a curve over a finite field. You say, well, I have some, some V polynomials. I look at how close points of C split in the covering and then because I have a non-trivial Galois closure, there are other curves that appear as quotients of the Galois closure. And so I sort of transfer information to get points counts about those curves. And then they have isogeny factors in their Jacobian. So I get some more debate polynomials and I kind of mash all that together. And uh, to complete the classification uh, based on this, you need to find all, all the cyclic covers. I'll just mention there actually is a cover of degree seven that occurs. So there, there, there are some interesting examples. Um, this would be straightforward in Magma, just computing class field theory for function fields, except that I need, a, I need a table of curves of genus up to seven over F2. And this does not currently exist. Uh, there's a table up to genus four in the LMFDB, uh, and there's work on genus five that's ongoing. 
uh, genus six and seven should be doable because Mukai has these beautiful descriptions of canonical curves in terms of homogeneous, certain homogeneous spaces, but there's a computational problem that is not yet done to, to finish this classification. And I think except for my references, that's the last slide. So I will end there.